Hey, Dave, long time no see. <laughs> you see you, Mark. Uh, we'll just give folks a minute or so to, to join. Um, uh, and I am Mark Carroll for folks that I have not met. And I'm the Chief Medical Officer with Health Choice Arizona. Uh, we are so fortunate to have Dr. Dave Engelthaler uh, present to us today on the genomic epidemiology of COVID-19 in Arizona. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes while folks are joining from other meetings, um, one of which was a meeting that Dave and I were just on and perhaps some of you were as well. Uh, we are going to be recording today's session. Um, and the way the webinar is set up, uh, that you will be able to chat questions. Uh, Jennifer Pierce, uh, who is providing the, the support for this today and facilitating this. There's Jennifer. Hey, Jen. Um, thanks especially to, to Jen for, for helping facilitate this. And, and if you ask questions in the chat, Jen will make sure that, um, that they get to Dr. Engelthaler um, at the right time in the presentation. Um, so please don't hesitate to enter questions into the chat at any time along the way. Uh, we may not get to them right away, but we'll make sure that we get to them as best we can during the, the presentation. Uh, I am doggy paddling a little bit towards making sure that we give folks time to, to join. We will go one more minute and then we'll get started. Uh, and, and I'll formally introduce Dr. Engelfeld. Now, Dave, that is quite the picture you have in front like of that. Uh, yeah, where does where does that where does that come from? How does that graphic? Is that an artistic rendering? Is that from um, that? That is originally yeah an artistic rendering of a colorized electron micrograph, but it what did not originate from TGen. All right, so you don't look through an electron micrograph and see that, especially with TGen, uh, around the outside of it. <laughs> yeah, and the spikes I, I hear are not actually red. <laughs> no, if it was, they might be easier to, to spot. Uh, well, why don't we get started? I know other folks will join as we get going, and a number of folks I know are interested in either connected on the phone or interested in the recording. But uh, special thanks to Dave Engelthaler, director of TGen North, um, based in Flagstaff. Uh, I've been fortunate to know Dave for a number of years and learned from him mm -hmm. on, in, a, in a whole range of ways. Um, but Dave, we're super fortunate in Arizona, um, and I would say kind of really nationally and internationally for the phenomenal work that TGen is known for, and the really important work that you're actively engaged in right now in the COVID-19 pandemic and response. So Dave, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks so much for being with us. You bet. Thanks, Mark. And, and Mark, make sure you let me know if anything goes wonky with my slides or my sound. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's great to be on this um, call and, and, and talk about something that's really our bread and butter at TGen. As, as a lot of folks know, and I've interacted with a lot of you just through, the, through our um, clinical diagnostic lab for COVID, which is really only three months old, not even three months old. Uh, we just hit our 10,000th sample, as I was telling Mark, just about a half hour ago uh, in the lab. And the vast majority of all those are Northern Arizona or are um, you know, populations not necessarily in the, the mass market and, and working with a, a number of tribes in Arizona, certainly a lot of counties uh, working with shelters and, and inpatient facilities and, and, and other congregate settings and jails. Uh, and, and so that's where the majority of that testing has come from. But today I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, genomic epidemiology, which is really my background. I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist. I'm the former state epi for Arizona. I uh, spent some years at, at CDC and really excited that for the last uh, 13 years here in Arizona, we've been building up this, this capacity um, to use genomics to advance public health. Uh, in, in ways that uh, we never, I never really could when I was worked in the government sector. So in, in, I tell a lot of folks I do a lot more public health now than I did um, working at the, the state, local, or, or federal level. Um, but very glad to be working with all of, all of our public health partners. And so um, 
I'm going to hit a little bit of history and then jump into to COVID just to get everybody up to speed. I'll actually hit a little bit of genomics too, because I don't think everybody on this uh, Zoom call is, is a genomics expert, and, and I'm not going to go too far into details. Uh, but just uh, one slide on, on background at TGen North um, and why, why TGen North. Uh, we have a 13-year public health and, and safety history, as, as I was mentioning, and, and we use that moniker genomic first responders. And it's because TGen is a, we're a nonprofit research lab. Uh, the T is translational. So we try to translate genomic discovery into applications in human health, uh, be it public health or clinical medicine or uh, public safety and, and biodefense. So we've uh, participated in dozens of disease outbreaks uh, in, in working with uh, local, state, tribal, uh, federal, and even global health partners. Uh, we've helped CDC develop their own genomics capacity over the past seven years, seven plus years, uh, which is really been gone from, uh, and, and they'll even admit, uh, close to being irrelevant to being the, the lead in, in genomic analysis and genomic public health around the world. Uh, we supported Arizona during the swine flu pandemic uh, back in 2009. We actually found the first, identified the first case of swine flu in Arizona because CDC was backlogged with testing, uh, which sounds familiar. And, um, and we were able to work directly with the state health department and the state lab to, to identify the, those cases. Uh, we've got a number of biodefense and other biosafety projects with a, a lot of three letter agencies. Uh, some aren't listed. And, and now we're working on um, coronavirus. But before we talk about the genomic um, epidemiology side of coronavirus, let's just talk a little bit about uh, what is the science behind genomic epi. So some of you, this is going to be really basic, and some of you, um, um, it may be some of the first time you, you've seen or, or, or get some of this background on what we're trying to do. So essentially what we're doing is analyzing the genetic material, the RNA or the DNA of an important pathogens, and then we look for mutations in that the genomes of these organisms that lead to diversity, that lead to potential phenotypic changes that, you know, in bacteria that could be antibiotic resistance and in viruses that could be virulence or antiviral resistance, uh, could be changes that lead to difference in, in uh, transmissibility as well. Uh, and then we build phylogenetic trees or essentially family trees uh, using that genetic information, kind of what I've I refer to as the ancestry.com for pathogens. And then we established a relationship among all of the genomes that we're studying. And then we can rule in cases, rule out cases as part of clusters. We can identify source locations, infer molecular clock to understand how old a lineage is uh, and, and try to identify the most recent common ancestor of, of, um, of, of a group of organisms. And, and we're using all of that now with COVID just to kind of visualize that a little bit better. So the genomic diversity I was talking about essentially comes from an organism that, you know, essentially self-replicates, which uh, viruses do and a lot of bacteria do. And typically when they replicate, they rec replicate their genome uh, perfectly. But every once in a while you get one of these mutational events shown here with these black stars uh, that actually leads to a change in the genome. And that's what we look for is those changes. So then we see this diversity out here on the ends of these branches, which is pretty intuitive and fairly opposite or obvious. Um, how we do it is a little tricky. So what we're looking for is mutation. And, and in this case, in the viruses, what we're looking for is SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms. It just means essentially that the mutation of one of those nucleotides or bases in the genome, one of the ACs, Gs, or Us, which is in RNA or, or AC, Gs, and Ts, which is in DNA, uh, and to see one mutate into another. And, and they mutate because during the replication process of the genome, uh, there's, there is some error correcting, but viruses have a really terrible error correcting mechanism as opposed to higher organisms. Uh, and so mutations show up more often. It, the wrong base gets put into place, and then it may stay inside that uh, genome and, um, through its descendants. So some of those SNPs, those mutations, cause changes in the protein structure uh, which actually changes the flavor of the organism and, and maybe it makes it, um, you know, it could make it resistant to an antiviral or make it more transmissible or, or sometimes it does nothing at all. And, and either way, these changes are really useful for us to monitor, to look for, monitor, and then 
uh, do the phylogenetic analysis to understand those relationships. Uh, here's just a, a picture, it's, it's a little sloppy, and all we're showing is here with, with three samples, uh, this is genetic sequences. And what we're looking at is these genetic sequences for this sample all aligned on top of each other, they're all the same, so we get lots of copies of it. And then we look to see any differences between samples. And in this case, the only difference between these three samples is that sample Y has an A here where samples X and Z have a G in this location. And so that is now a SNP, and then we monitor that. And then we look through the entirety of the genome uh, for all of these mutations, and then that's what we can do uh, to build, to essentially infer the relationships between organisms. So again, when we're thinking about um, organisms, this is what we typically see. We don't see the tree. We don't see those original ancestors. We see what's showing up in patients or in other pathogens was showing up in nature. And then we, we got to do is figure out how are these guys related to each other. And we sequence those genomes, find the SNPs, and the, the, do some statistical analysis to build the tree then backwards. Uh, so then we can understand uh, how old some of these are, because we can put a molecular clock on it, how fast mutations may occur, uh, and then try to identify then the, the ancestor. So the ancestor of these uh, dots up here that are all in, in black uh, was this individual. Uh, which then came out of this following a mutational event. Uh, the ancestor for this entire population is this individual. We can um, see, you know, you could think, well, this is like the original organism, the original virus coming out of China, and this is what's now showing up around the world. And we'll sh I'll show you more specifics on that. So let's actually get into, um, get into coronavirus. The COVID is, is COVID-19. Uh, is caused, is the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2, as we all know, and, and probably a lot of you have seen this tree, came out pretty early on, uh, looking at this new coronavirus, and, and what back then was called the novel coronavirus, and how it fits into the, the entirety of the, of the coronavirus family tree. So we're going to see a lot of trees. This one looks at all coronaviruses, um, and what we're able to see is, actually, this is looking at all uh, beta coronaviruses, if I'm correct, uh, and not the, the alpha coronaviruses, which includes a couple of the human, uh, regular human strains. But what we see is this is the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and these all look essentially identical when you compare them to the, all the other coronaviruses. But they're clearly on this branch of the family tree. And this branch, what we call in clade three here, actually this is, this is uh, clade three, this is the SAR, SARB covirus, which is made up of three clades. These are all SARS uh, coronaviruses that all seem to have a bat origin. This is why everybody talks about the bat origin of COVID-19 virus. Uh, here is the original SARS virus that, that we saw back in 2002 uh, on this particular tree. And it's related to a large number of other um, coronaviruses that have been pulled out of bats, identified in bats, most of them in China, if not all of them in China, sorry, went backwards. Um, and then this one pops out. And that's why, uh, you know, this is clearly a bat coronavirus. Uh, whether or not it was being studied in a lab in, in Wuhan, China, we don't know and we'll likely never know, but it certainly originated out of bats, most likely out of horseshoe bats uh, in China where a large number of these are coming out of. Then there's other members of the, the coronavirus family down here is MERS, and you guys remember MERS from 2012 out of Saudi Arabia, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus. Uh, and then further down, there's a couple human coronaviruses that are part of this group, the beta coronaviruses. Uh, and these are typically what cause our, the common cold type of a coronavirus, very far removed from these bat um, SARS coronaviruses. So that's the, the, the overall family tree. But this tells us nothing about the relationship between individual strains, uh, what we need to look at within SARS-CoV-2. And for that, we look at, um, we just only look at the, the uh, COVID-19 coronaviruses and compare them to each other. Uh, so here's a, um, a view of one of the, the great tools that we're using, which is called Next Strain. We've used this tool that helps us develop trees and, and tie it to time and to space geographically. Uh, we've used this for West Nile and, and uh, actually using it for group A strep uh, genomic tracking and some other pathogens. 
and it was immediately used for, uh, for coronavirus. And what you're seeing here is um, a, a sampling, about 5,000 strains uh, that have been um, sequenced from around the world. Uh, and, and I'll show you the actual live tool here in a second. Uh, and then we can infer the, where, which direction they're going, where they're coming from, uh, and, and how they're um, starting to um, spread around in, in local environments and, and actually understand some of the stories of the transmission. And then if we look at just the Arizona samples, this is, this is again, just a subsampling, uh, but you can see Arizona uh, samples here highlighted with the red dots and the thicker branches on this tree. We, we have samples from all over uh, and that's, that's giving us a lot of interesting stories. It is not essentially one strain that came into Arizona that is spread around uh, the state. It is many, many uh, introductions, likely 15 or more introductions of distinct lineages from other states and from other countries. And we can track a lot of that back using this tools and technologies. So what I'm gonna do is actually just jump out of this for a second and see if I can show you the live tool and hopefully this will work. And I think you can see that now. So this is that live tool that we call Next Stream that we've been uh, looking at globally. We see that messy map uh, on the side and that's just showing a lot of the directionality. What, what we can actually do with this particular tool, if I can find my arrow, there it is, um, is you know, we, we build the, the family tree. We can go in and select and just look at one individual sample. You see um, things keep popping up. This particular sample was identified in Japan. These early samples clearly were out in China. Um, you can see it says China on the black box. Um, give me a second just to look at that. Uh, and so everything in purple uh, is actually Asian. And then the European strains are all in this kind of yellowish green. Uh, the American strains are, the US strains are all in red. And the South American strains, which are just finally starting to come online uh, in this system are, are in orange as, as well as then the African strains. So there's a, um, and then we have uh, Australian strains as well. So what I'm just gonna do here is um, just show you um, how we can actually uh, visual, just one way to visualize this. So this is just looking at time. You can look on the map as well as the tree at the same time. Those original strains coming out of China, uh, this is back in January now. Uh, almost all the, the, the most infections were in, in China, but now you can see Europe is, is exploding and so is the US in, in the size of those circles. We can watch these transmission chains. Uh, it's really messy when you look at all of them at once, but it just kind of gives you an idea how we're able to, to genomically track this virus over time and space. Uh, and so then when we zero in on particular clades or particular uh, locations, we can uh, get a more refined story. I hope that that's coming across. Okay, so um, with that, then, as I mentioned, we've got, I just have a couple examples. We could dive into these. I don't want to um, scroll around too much inside uh, inside this. And you guys can all find this at, at nextstrain.org. That's N-E-X-T-S-T-R-E. S-T-R-A-I-N dot org, so nextstrain.org. And then you can link to a lot of other pathogens too, but the COVID, uh, the COVID stuff is there and you can play around in there. It's really fascinating. And, 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 and I warn you, uh, it's more addicting than, um, I don't know what's addicting on social media because I don't have any, but uh, it, you can spend a lot of time here. Uh, here's I, a, I don't know, Dave. It's a little scary to watch the uh, the bubbles explode around <laughs> around the world. There, it is. It's fascinating. So, in, in this particular view, we're just uh, highlighted. I think I just highlighted Arizona genomes. So this is about 171 Arizona genomes. Uh, what we have in the queue right now is about a a, a thousand genomes, which we're starting to um, we're, we're finishing up on sequencing. We have uh, and then another. Um, 400, 500 in-house, and then we're, we're going to be expecting um, another 4,000 coming in starting next week from uh, commercial lab partners. So we're really getting a very robust genomic look at just Arizona, and it'll look just as complex as this. But for now, here's the Arizona strains. As I mentioned, they're scattered across the, the entirety of the tree, some coming from, um, some coming from Asia, which is these uh, you can kind of see the background is purple. These are really the Asian lineages. 
And this up here is the European uh, and, and in some cases dominated by, uh, you know, multiple European countries, of course, and then uh, the Americas uh, in, in a lot from New York and, and, um, and California and Washington and then elsewhere too. And I'll, I'll talk about a couple of stories. Uh, we can see in some cases on these Arizona branches, you see a whole bunch of dots. And that means that lineage showed up and then caused a lot of infections. And then in some cases, individual lineages come in and you only have a single case. This here is the very first Arizona case. You can see the timeline across the bottom there. This um, it says in here, I don't have it on this. Oh yeah, 122. So January 22nd, that was that first Arizona case. It was an ASU student uh, right out of China. And this is just showing there is no other Arizona cases that came out of that. Uh, it did not continue to cause any other infections. That was a dead end lineage. And, and part, part of that absolutely was the public health response, getting around that, um, uh, making sure that there weren't any other additional cases. Uh, and, and we actually seen you know, several instances where lineages come in and cause just one uh, case or just a couple of cases. Uh, and that's happened up here in the European lineages too. Uh, but there's a large number of, of lineages that have come into Arizona that have caused outbreaks and, and in some cases very significant outbreaks and I'll talk about a, a couple of those stories. Uh, it's interesting to look, uh, you know, in the U.S. we can see some of the other um, things that are happening. This is, a, this is just a blow up of that tree and what's highlighted here in yellow, in fact this is a, a different sampling. We have a, what do I have, about 2200 genomes in this particular tree. Uh, and all of the Louisiana genomes are put in here. And what's totally fascinating is this main branch here uh, is nearly the entirety of, of Louisiana. Uh, and, and most of that is um, New Orleans and, and Baton Rouge samples uh, all here. And then you can see there's some yellow dots uh, showing up that are just little one-offs for Louisiana. But almost everything is just in this one clade, which is very different to the Arizona story. If we go back and look at the common ancestor or the, the estimated common ancestor, most recent common ancestor, the inferred date here is 229. Now, February 29th is saying that the, that's the ancestor to this large Louisiana clade. Uh, what to me is very interesting and, and I think is very interesting to a number of folks is that is, I believe, two days, I'm trying to remember what, when it was, two or three days after um, Mardi Gras. So the, it is quite likely that Mardi Gras was an, an absolute um, source for a very large outbreak in Louisiana. Now it could be there was something else going on in Louisiana, but I think that's the single biggest thing that was happening right about that time. And it led to a very large number of cases, uh, almost 300 um, genomes in here, and, and I think thousands of cases in, in Louisiana from that, that one uh, introduction and spreading event. We actually have a few Arizona cases that are highlighted in blue that seem to show up in this particular tree as well. Uh, we don't, we haven't traced back the epi, um, the connection to Louisiana. Did some of these actually go to Mardi Gras, which we think is uh, definitely possible. Uh, certainly looks to be part of that clade though. So that's a, that's a very, one of the very interesting stories that's coming up. Another one uh, was a story that was in uh, the New York Times and the importance, looking at the importance of New York uh, as, a, as a hub, what I, I was able to refer to New York as the Grand Central Station for COVID-19 in the U.S., uh, which the, the New York Times uh, uh, interestingly quoted and then it ended up in headlines around the world. Uh, so I got to kind of label New York as, as a, a main um, cause for distribution, but it's certainly not the only distribution source. And in, in, in actuality, a lot of Arizona or a lot of New York cases, even though they came out of the main clades came out of Europe, actually come from other states showing up in New York as well. And we, we definitely think we have some of that from Arizona. I can push play on this too. Uh, and just looking at kind of the New York experiences, that's growing the number of cases getting really large. We can see those lines. I don't, I don't know how well you can see them. It might be moving too fast. Um, and I'll just play it one more time at, at medium speed as soon as that stops. Um, and we can, you know, get some understanding of the, the variety of strains. And so I think that some of these are, um, we have to check, and some of these are moving into New York and moving out of New York to California, back into New York. 
Uh, and so these are, um, these are anyways, helping us understand the movement of the, the virus uh, around the country. Now, what I want to do is go back to my slides, show you a couple, instead of just jumping in on, on some of these live, just do some screenshots of some of the things that we're seeing in Arizona. Um, sorry, distracted there. Is that my PowerPoint? There, back to the PowerPoint. Yep, we're back there. Thanks. Okay, so um, here's a an interesting example of where we see a couple Arizona cases in a dead end lineage, and we've looked uh, for uh, some time now. I've not seen any other cases as part of this lineage, and we don't know where it came from. Uh, these are these two cases are epi linked to each other. We know that, uh, but when we put it in the the tree with all the other genomes, it's in this clay that is dominantly. Australia. So Australia, New Zealand, um, you know, we see it on, on here. Uh, we, we can't say for certain that the Arizona cases were linked to that. Uh, we know one of these is a healthcare provider and may have had uh, contact then with a patient or a traveler from Australia. There was no contact directly to Australia from, from these cases that we know of. But this, this Australian clay definitely originated out of a U.S. clay and, and mostly in southern U.S., so Georgia and South Carolina, a uh, likely visitor uh, from that region, uh, making it to um, the, the Australia region and then spreading from there. Uh, and then the U.S. originated out of, see this purple, these are clearly the Asian, we know this, this is Asian and, and uh, a Chinese origin here. So uh, China to Georgia to Australia to Arizona, uh, which is a fascinating leap, um, but um, these these um, stories and, and some of them we're, we'll never chase down the, the shoe leather epidemiology, but at least we have some understanding of, of where strains have come in from. Another uh, interesting example, and, oh, I, and I mentioned the New York uh, clay. So here are the New York strains. So here's a dominant New York clay. So the virus, as we know, was devastating in New York. Everything here in green is New York. So pretty much all of this clade is a New York clade, and then it pops up in, in some other states, including in Arizona. We had a cluster of cases that have come out of this as well. So we know that uh, New York was a source for some Arizona strains, but certainly not all of them, and are not even a majority of them. When we look in uh, Arizona more specifically, we do see some interesting uh, we do see some interesting outbreaks, and this one is a uh, a specific Arizona population where we see really high attack rates, lots of infections in a fairly s relatively uh, small localized population. Uh, and the, the entirety of that outbreak is uh, seen here in the yellow dots. We don't have any other direct Arizona connections uh, to this group. And in fact, the rest of this uh, that's in green are, are, there's some Arizona down here, uh, a number of other states around the country, and, and I think a couple other countries within this particular group. So this is one of the branches. But once it hits here, this is all within this one Arizona population. And it's defined, this branch here uh, is defined, everything within this group has a SNP that essentially changes an amino acid in the spike protein uh, at a particular location. Now, we've done some uh, protein analysis and, and uh, and it looks like it's, it's quite likely that that change did not uh, actually have an effect, a deleterious effect on the protein, uh, probably at a neutral effect. And so may have nothing to do with uh, the fact that we're just getting a very large outbreak. And now there's hundreds of patients in this one outbreak, uh, but it, it certainly defines the outbreak and it could have something to do with it. One other um, interesting is we've looked um, even closer is that there's some difference in timing on this. So the, this uh, particular outbreak um, really is mostly off of this branch. And this is where everything uh, really since early April is showing up in this part of that clay. That branch, if we look at it closely, is also uh, defined by a SNP. Oh, I just, sorry, I wanted to zoom out a second. So you could see, just to, we went back. This is just that one branch. If we zoom out, uh, now, and look at the entirety of the, the global tree, this is saying that that one, it's not just defining this outbreak, but that one SNP 
that shows up, that one mutation that is here, we don't see it in any of the other global strains within this analysis. And then when we go, and there's about 5,000 strains in this analysis, if we go and look at the entirety of the of everything that's been sequenced, which is not in this tree, which is like 35,000 strains now, we actually see that SNP only showing up in just three or four other locations, uh, which is, and, and not causing any other outbreaks. So it's a very rare mutation uh, and is really uh, interesting that it's part of this, this clay that's taken off here in Arizona. One other, and so what I was pointing out is that one, one branch, so most everything, so after, so this is like April 10th or, or 12th here, on this right about here where my cursor is, pretty much everything since then has been part of this, this branch, this single branch. And this one actually has another mutation that only shows up uh, really in this clade, and I think in two other strains out of the 30 plus thousand genomes that have been looked at. And that one is in a uh, gene that is predicting to have a, an actual deleterious effect on the gene, or excuse me, on the protein. So maybe actually having an effect on uh, the outbreak itself and maybe why we see so much transmission occurring. There's, that's a whole story that's still being put together. I'm not um, revealing much information about where this is. Uh, we're working with the folks on the ground uh, to get as much epidemiology behind this. Uh, we do just know that it's, a, it's really a fascinating uh, outbreak and we can help um, we can help better understand what's going on by looking at the genomics, not just helping the epidemiology, but maybe even helping understand uh, the, the virus itself and why it might be behaving differently. So with that, I think I've taken up a little over 30 minutes of your time. Um, I think that was my last uh, specific slide, uh, just throwing this up there because, um, you know, TGen is, uh, been able to do this work. We are the reference lab for the state of Arizona and for all positive samples and to do, to do sequencing. And, and we've developed a union of genomics experts, viral experts, and even coronavirus experts across the state of the three state universities uh, and here at TGen that are helping to analyze all this data uh, and, and provide it to the public health, to, to, to clinical uh, um, to, the, to the clinicians in the state, as well as uh, providing it then to the world by putting, putting our uh, genomes into the global databases for others to, to, to use for research and to better understand this virus. And I've been, um, it's been pointed out, and I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, as a nonprofit, what we were able to do this because of the, the good graces of the, the foundations and philanthropy uh, and some organizations in Arizona who have donated money to TGen. Uh, locally here, the Narva Institute stepped up first. Uh, we've been working with them for actually for quite some time to build genomics uh, and genomic epidemiology for infectious disease here. Uh, and so they, they helped out. And then we also had others like the Flynn Foundation and, and, um, and uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield and a number of other great foundations uh, have helped donate. And now recently we have a contract with the state of Arizona to continue this work forward. So I just got to point that out. This, this work is, um, uh, has to be paid for by somebody and, and there's a lot of great people um, providing that support. So with that, Mark, um, I think maybe I'll turn it back to you or to Jen uh, to see if there's any questions or I'm not sure the best way to do this. I'm not don't want everybody to just jump in. So. Sure. No, that's great. And and Jen, well, I may turn to you in just a, just a second. Uh, Dave, thanks for that overview. Um, a complex topic uh, made understandable. So super appreciate that as well as the expertise that that you, T. Jen, bring to this. And 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 thanks for that acknowledgement of those other key organizations like the NARB Institute, Flynn Foundation, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona that have helped contribute to the ability uh, of this work moving forward. Um, this is one snippet of, of, of possibility that we've seen insight into uh, through your presentation, not just for COVID-19 and coronavirus, but really for our, our public health epi and infectious disease epi work in the future. Uh, I have a really simple question to kick us off. Uh, when should I use the term strain? And when should I not? You've used the term lineages, mutations, strains. Um, uh, 
And clades, um, is a clade a major strain or is any mutation with a SNP change a, a strain? <laughs> yeah, so these, uh, these terms can be, in many cases, used interchangeably. The way I look at this is that in, an isolate comes from an individual patient. A strain is essentially um, a, all the isolates are, are the same strain if they don't have any differences in them. Uh, and, and so then a clade is a group of strains that are all closely related to each other. Uh, th this is also what a lineage is. A lineage is uh, essentially just a series of organisms that have descended from, from a common ancestor. And so all of this is really a lineage of, SAR of a SARS virus that came out of a bat in China somewhere. Uh, but each of the individual branches are also individual lineages as well. I hope that clarifies that. No, that's helpful. So a strain is, is any change um, in any mutation, and some are significant clinically and public health, and some are not. And that's what the work that you do helps us to differentiate moving forward. So that's, that's helpful for me, hopefully for others. One other question, and then, and then Jen, I'm gonna see what kind of questions have come in across the chat for Dave. One other question is, how, talk a little bit about the confidentiality of communities and people in communities when we do this genomic analysis. Again, this is the genomic analysis of the particular infectious um, uh, uh, agent that's causing someone to become sick. But it's important, and I noticed that you were careful to not identify communities where there may be particular differences in strains. Yeah, our, our um, you know, we, we definitely want to abide by kind of the, the public health rules here of we only re, only information that is re revealed that is the least amount of information that's revealed necessary to do the uh, investigations. And so in some cases, we have to uh, really dive in and even get down to patient level data, but we only do that uh, confidentially with the provider of that information uh, at, the, at the local level. But when we share this information globally, the, the genomes that we post, we post them into two different uh, databases. One, the first, as soon as we get the data, we post it into a place called GISA, G-I-S-A-I-D, and that's one of the sites that is globally collecting all the genomes. With that, we only tie um, to every sample, every genome, uh, the label of Arizona and then the date that the sample was collected. And that's just to get data out there as quick as possible. Uh, and that's a, that's a very rough um, resolution geographically, but it's enough um, to share first. And then once we go through all the analyses, work with public health, work with clinicians, we, whatever we identify uh, as something that we may publish uh, with those groups, uh, then that, that information will get uh, posted along as metadata into NCBI, which is the National Institutes of Health database uh, for genomes. And, and that's, again, one of these global sites. And, and the lowest resolution, again, is just at that point, is just going to be county and uh, date of collection. Uh, and, and we only do that if we're, uh, when we're going to publish. And, and that's with approvals of, of all those involved specific communities, we, we don't do that. Um, we will lead, we will be at a supporting role for anybody who's representing a specific community and they will determine what level of information gets made public. Great, thank you, Dave, appreciate that. Uh, Jen, any questions from the chat? So far, no one has, has typed anything in. Um, we have the chat box and we also have the Q&A box open, so you can use either one of those modalities to get questions to us. Great, thank you. So please do that. Oh, there is a question. I'm, all, I'm full of questions, so if you guys don't ask questions, I'll take a few minutes to do that, but um, a couple of questions coming in. Um, uh, first question, I can read this one if that's helpful, and you can probably see it too, Dave, but I can't, actually. To link specific strains to less severe manifestations, including asymptomatic spread. That was my next question. Yeah, I think that is a, that's a great question. Uh, we know that asymptomatic cases um, are showing up around the world, and it's not likely that any individual lineage uh, is causing that. We don't uh, know um, for certain, but there hasn't been any evidence to date to show that there's some genomic 
a cause for that phenotype. And, and it may not be a specific um, viral phenotype, and maybe it's more likely the individual who's infected. Uh, we do know that uh, asymptomatic cases occur. We think asymptomatic spread, uh, and this is the way it's kind of been from the beginning, is, is fairly limited. The concern is that it does happen, that you may have somebody who's a carrier that can transmit. Uh, but there's a, a couple of things in there I'll just add in as, as maybe more questions come in. Uh, is that a, a large number of the asymptomatic cases that have been identified, and this is not, this is not um, pre-symptomatic, because some people may not have symptoms when they show positive, and then all of a sudden they start showing symptoms. Uh, this is people who never show symptoms, uh, that they have a, a low level infection, in, by and large, not, a, not in every case. So you, what you have is an individual who has a low viral load uh, and no symptoms, that are gonna help expel the virus out of the body. So their risk of spreading is very low. So if there are some lineages that are causing kind of this asymptomatic case, uh, they're gonna have a hard time actually um, transmitting and surviving. So it's probably not a very fit mutation if, the, if there is one driving that. But I think it's more of a, a human phenotype rather than a, a viral phenotype. Yeah, and speaking of that, um, uh, just as a quick follow-up, what type of opportunities do you think there are, Dave, for uh, human immunologists um, to start to parse out the different immune profiles that many of us have? Some are similar, but some immune profiles could be different um, that may um, bring certain susceptibility to certain types of, say, viral strains. Um, do you see that as an area for, for future work? Well, there's no doubt that um, there is, there's definitely immune profiling studies that are happening in TGen. Uh, we have an immunologist here in house actually, who's uh, fantastic at using some of these next generation tools to um, better understand the, the, the body's response, uh, especially the, the response to different uh, antigens that may be produced by the, the virus. And so that's helping to develop uh, improved um, serology testing, uh, it's helping us to understand how useful plasma therapy might be, as well as then uh, whether or not vaccines may be providing lasting immunity and maybe um, some better targeted areas for uh, vaccine development for uh, longer term stability uh, of, of an immune response. So uh, genomics is definitely playing a, a role in this data getting out uh, into the global databases is just adding to the data that's being able to be used for those particular types of studies. Yeah, it's such an important field moving forward. I think the, the, the field of immunology and the interface with, uh, with our environment, it's, it's a key one health topic, but where there's so much learning that we, that we have there, I think moving forward. Um, Nancy um, had answered a question. I think I answered it properly, but I'm just checking with you, Dave. She asked about the URL uh, I typed in um, that it was, um, uh, what did I type in, nextstrain.org to be able to see these? Is that the, uh, the appropriate, anything else that, that we should mention to folks? No, that's, that's, uh, that's a great place to start. And then that brings up a screen of which you can see uh, actually different pathogens that are in Nextstrain, but you can click on COVID, you can click on just the North American analysis. Uh, and then once you get in there, it's pretty, it's pretty intuitive and in, in, in be able to uh, use the different uh, the different links and, and the different tools. And I'm happy if anybody wants to walk through that, I'm happy to, to work with anybody offline on that. Great, thank you. Uh, another question, thanks Angela for your comment to Dave. Uh, he is the treasure for us and it was a great presentation. Um, mm -hmm. Hey, um, Jen, uh, what are the logistics about the presentation being available? So the recording is gonna be too large to send out in the email. So I don't know if you want to talk with um, Jimmy Elkins, our internal staff, on posting it on the website. Okay. So I think that's on me, Angela. I have to figure out where we're posting this. Um, maybe we can collaborate with some some folks about um, about posting it. Um, uh, and then, then a very easy question from um, from Mary Jo Gregory. Uh, uh, and I say that facetiously. It's a great question. Uh, what keeps you up at night uh, regarding COVID, Dave? Thanks for the question, Mary Jo, uh, and good to almost talk to you. 
the, you know, I think the thing that keeps me up is the fact that even when we were shut down, probably as much as we possibly could as a society and, and hadn't done before, we couldn't protect those that were going to get sickest and die. The, the biggest problem outside of the northern Arizona region um, has been the long-term care facilities, the assisted living facilities, as far as it goes for serious illness and death. We knew that this was the highest risk group. Uh, we know that uh, that's exactly what happened. The, the fatality rates in those over 65 is, is 18 plus percent, which is essentially unheard of. We shouldn't be seeing that. Uh, and the, the fatality rates of those infected in assisted living, which is typically people who are going to not only be elderly, but multiple chronic conditions, is uh, 33%. So a third of those uh, that were at most risk are, are dying and and so it, to me, whether we're opened up or, or closed down, we couldn't protect them. And, and that's, that's, we're losing an entire generation that way, or at least a significant chunk of that. So I'm, uh, that, that part distresses me. I'm not sure how we're gonna do that. If we can't, as we open up and we can't follow those guidelines uh, to, to at least limit, we're not gonna prevent, but limit the amount of spread through the community, but we absolutely have to prevent the spread in, in these congregate settings uh, to, to whatever extent we can. And, and I'm just, um, it's that that's disheartening that we've not been able to do that um, and that's that's probably been the biggest negative uh, for me as opposed I mean there's obviously the situation that uh, happened with the Navajo Nation uh, that it's really sounds like uh, things are improving which is fantastic uh, and we knew that that high-risk populations where you have uh, health disparities and and um, and the variety of uh, reasons why there was an outbreak within the Navajo Nation, we knew that was gonna happen and we couldn't prevent that either. So these things that we know that are gonna hit us the worst and we can't stop, that's what keeps me up at night. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, Mary Jo Gregory and, and thank her for her for leadership, leadership of the NARB Institute and, and, and the vision of supporting the, the, the work of just genomics um, in general related to next gen um, public health. and. Um, my apologies that we were set up today to take chat questions this way and not open up the phones. We just weren't sure how many po folks were going to be able to join and we wanted to be able to make sure that we understood um, to be able to have a, a quiet environment where we didn't have to mute microphones, but appreciate the question, Mary Jo. Thanks and thanks Dave for the answer. Um, uh, Karen Holder had chatted in, um, Dave, I think we may have answered it, but I'm going to read it again just to be sure because there may be a nuance here that, that I, when I'm quickly reading it, I'm missing. Is there enough data on lineages to trace virulence of different strains right now? So that gets back to that question, do, what do we know now in terms of understanding virulence? And is virulence related to spread because some of those lineages just stop? Is that because that person recovered, didn't spread, or is that maybe it's a less virulent strain? Yeah, so there, we still don't know a lot about that. Um, what we're gonna attempt to do here in, in working with the state of Arizona on the, um, look, be like 5,500 genomes that we'll have, uh, is to be able to get the, the clinical data. We don't get any uh, PHI, but we, we, we can get enough we think clinical data to understand at least the, the fatalities uh, and maybe the hospitalized cases versus the non-hospitalized and see can we um, determine if there's any lineages that are associated with those. I know a large number of groups are looking at this uh, around the, the country. Uh, it just, there's just so much, um, the, you know, the variants that we're seeing, the high fatality rates are definitely in these at-risk populations. So we may just need to focus at the non-high-risk populations, the ones that didn't seem to have a risk for having serious disease or death, and try to see if those lineages, um, which are going to be few or far between, have some um, mutation, some genotype uh, that may be causing a, a, a higher virulence. Um, because the, the, the high-risk groups are they're getting serious illness and, and dying from all these lineages. Is there any genotype understanding, maybe too early again for this too, but for the system inflammatory condition that uh, children and young people are, are seeing? Any suggestive evidence that you might be aware of right now? Not that I know of. We've uh, reached out to 
Uh, one of the hospitals back east, uh, just some folks at TGen know, know them there, to see if we can get the, the genomes or at least the, the isolates, the, the samples from, uh, I think there's some 44 kids that were seen in one facility uh, and see if we can identify some commonalities, but I haven't seen that being done yet. Thanks, obviously a great and important piece of work and, and maybe tying that to the immunology that uh, of those particular children who uh, perhaps had such an, an immune system storm in response to, to illness and exposure. Sheila Mackles asked, um, how is this work? Um, I'm reframing your question a little bit, Sheila. She's asked, is the work informing vaccine development? Uh, I would imagine there's a how part of that too. Dave, can you answer that? Yeah, I think, um, I, I guess the way to answer that is, is yes in a general sense. That this is, we are not specifically working on vaccines and, and the immunology group here uh, is really more focused on understanding the immune response under different treatments uh, as well as um, trying to develop some plasma therapy uh, capabilities and, and better um, serologic diagnostics. So not specifically at TGen, but the data we're making to the available to the global community. And we know that a large number of the vaccine, vaccine development groups are using the, the global genomic data. So it, in a general sense, we are. Uh, thankfully, a lot of vaccines have already been developed and they're, they're in uh, somewhere in kind of, um, well, we know that a handful um, are definitely going through uh, various trials already, uh, phase one and, and into phase two. Uh, and there's some already some lead candidates and, and clearly the world is hoping that, that a couple of these are gonna make it out the other end in, in a way that can be manufactured and distributed um, by early next year, at least to some of the high risk groups and those that care for them. Uh, but you know, I, I, hopefully we're still gonna continue to do vaccine development work because whatever we do can definitely be improved upon. And do you think, and if this is not in your space, that's okay and forgive the question, but you know, the, for the flu vaccine, there are three major strain contributors um, to the vaccine that's developed um, every year, probably based on the three different uh, protein um, uh, drivers. And this is where I'm going past my memory banks for, uh, for, for types A and B. Um, is there any, evidence that you're aware of that say a strain, or excuse me, that there may be multiple strains that will inform some common vaccine development in coronavirus or is it just very different? Yeah, you know, let me see if I can just um, pull that one back up. So we look at this particular tree, um, we see that this is the, the SARS-CoV-2 and everything comes out of this, but there's not there's not a lot of variability when you compare it to the other SARS strains. We, we do uh, know that some people are looking at a, uh, a SARS vaccine, a, a pan-SARS vaccine approach that would uh, provide uh, protection against all of these uh, that are part of the SARS group. Uh, some are looking at a, at a uh, coronavirus just in general and so that we would finally have an actual coronavirus uh, vaccine that, to not only prevent this deadly disease, but also the common cold or a large amount of that, which is, is fantastic. Uh, but uh, within this group, we anticipate that vaccines should be protective against the, this larger, or, or the, the whole population of the SARS-CoV-2. Even with the amount of mutations that we're seeing that we can trace all those mutations, uh, we, we don't anticipate large enough antigenic variation that a vaccine wouldn't provide uh, protection at least uh, for, for the next couple of years and, and thinking about how much this mutates. Now that we don't know uh, if the, the virus itself will have some recombination effects and pick up large chunks of other coronaviruses. This is what influenza viruses do all the time and this is why we have to keep changing the vaccine uh, for, for influenza virus. So that might be another driver uh, for why we would have um, some, you know, have to have vaccine changes or, or updates. Great, that's helpful, appreciate that. Had another question um, asking, is TGen getting degree of illness info from ADHS? In other words, this gets to that issue of you have specimen. Uh, uh, what would be the status moving forward appropriately of aligning up strain and genomic results with degree of illness information? So um, yeah, that's a great question. I think 
primarily we're going to uh, be looking at that more at local levels where we're working with uh, providers or, or public health officials that are closest to these cases. We are getting access um, to the, the larger database. We're still working on it, but ADHS is working on it. We have the, the agreement going back and forth to be able to then see uh, information that may relate to outcomes. So hospitalization and death, uh, but not necessarily uh, individual, like symptoms or um, degree of illness or um, actually the, the different syndromes that we're seeing. I don't know at, to what level at this point, but we should be able to at least get that larger level and we could stratify it um, that way. Great, and, and perhaps some folks who are joining us today will have some insights into how to advance some of this work appropriately moving forward. Um, I think we've come to about the point of an hour, and so I'd um, like to close just with a special note of thanks, Dave, to you, um, not just for the presentation, it was really fascinating, um, but for your expertise, and most importantly, the commitment um, that you, your team, TGen North, and really the entire TGen team, the City of Hope brings to this. Um, this is really important work. And, um, and Dave, I know you and your team uh, worked tirelessly uh, since um, uh, you first uh, opened the lab and started receiving those CLIA-approved samples back on March 15th or 16th, because some of us remember that date well. Yeah. But, but your commitment and your work has just been superb and uh, the presentation demonstrates that, but support that you and TGen are providing um, the Arizona community during this time is, is very much appreciated. So I wanna thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, Mark. I appreciate those comments. I, I absolutely appreciate you. Uh, you've mentioned Mary Jo, others who we worked on very, this type of stuff very closely before COVID. And it was actually, we were able to switch gears really quickly. So I appreciate that. And then a, a large number of folks that, that I've seen that have been on this uh, Zoom call uh, have just been tremendous partners and, and uh, willing to, to uh, work with us, to help us get better, have patience with us. And we've been improving our processes to provide service to, to everyone as well. So again, thank you, uh, Mark, for, for hosting this and, and putting this together. It's been uh, it's been my honor to, to work with everyone here. Thank you. Thanks, Jen Pierce, for your support. Thank Thanks, you all for, for joining and being part of this. Um, and, and as Dave said, the work you're doing is, is super important. And um, we, all, we all are hopefully making a difference in supporting our communities together moving forward. So uh, we'll just close. Um, looking forward to continuing work together. Remember, uh, let's not spread coronavirus, let's spread kindness. And so thank you for everything you're doing to accomplish that. Have a good day.